Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing heart failure. So in this next part, we are going to discuss how heart failure can impact the kidneys, how heart failure can impact the lungs, and how heart failure can impact the liver. So we're going to begin with how heart failure can impact the kidneys, and this is so, so important to anyone who is practicing clinical medicine. So, let me launch into this speech. For reasons that I do not completely understand, and which I do not believe biomedical science completely understands, when someone has heart failure, and remember exactly what that means, that means that the cardiac output is reduced, so the flow around the circulatory system is reduced. When someone has heart failure, it leads to problems with the kidneys. Specifically, it leads to problems with the kidneys getting rid of water properly not getting rid of waste products, they can, you don't usually become uremic from this, so the waste products don't build up in the blood, the kidneys can still get rid of waste products normally, but as far as getting rid of fluid is concerned, they have real problems. This phenomenon can be referred to as cardiorenal failure. So, problems with the kidneys that result from problems with the heart. So I want to repeat it again because it's so important. When the cardiac output is reduced, in which is heart failure, the kidneys get problems. Specifically, they get problems with removing fluid. Not with removing waste products necessarily. They can still get rid of waste products into the urine perfectly uh, in many cases. But they do get problems with removing fluid from the body. This means that people with heart failure need to be very careful about how much fluid they consume. So we often put people with heart failure on fluid restrictions. We tell them, you know, you mustn't drink more than two liters a day because if they were to drink a huge amount of fluid, let's say they uh, drank five liters in one day, the kidneys would really struggle to get rid of that fluid. The fluid would obviously go into the gastrointestinal tract, it would get absorbed into the blood and then in people without heart failure, the kidneys would then just pee it all out. But in people with heart failure, the kidneys are really, really going to struggle to cope with that fluid load and actually remove it from the body. So what can happen then is they can become overloaded. Uh, so fluid overloaded. And the proper name for that is hypervolemia. So hypervolemia means that the volume of the blood is too high. Um, and this is a real problem with heart failure. The other the reason that people in clinical medicine need to be so aware of this is that we can give IV fluids in hospitals. And when you're giving IV fluids to someone with heart failure, you need to be really careful that you do not give it at too fast a rate. Because again, if just like if they drink too much, if you give them far too much IV fluids far too quickly, their kidneys are not going to be able to cope with that. They're not going to be able to get rid of that fluid as someone without heart failure would. Um, and you can put them into hypervolemia. And what are the results of hypervolemia? Well, when you overload the blood volume, that fluid has to go somewhere. Uh, generally, it ends up in the venous system more so than the arterial system. So when you imagine filling the whole circulatory system with blood, what generally happens is the arterial system is already very high pressure, so you can't really force more blood into that. So instead what happens is it all ends up pooling in the venous system, which is usually quite low pressure. So you end up with systemic venous hypertension. So the pressure in the venous system goes up. So systemic venous hypertension. And that then leads, of course, to the pressure within the capillaries being too high, because, of course, the whole circulatory system is connected to what to to, you know, it's one great big loop. So if the pressure within the venous system is too high, that backs up into the capillaries and the pressure within all the capillaries is far too high. And then fluid is going to leave the capillaries into the tissue. So you then get fluid pooling in the tissue. So you get edema. And I'm spelling this in the British way with the silent O at the beginning. But uh, if you're an American, feel free to drop uh, drop that. Um, so you get edema, fluid going out into the tissues and your tissues become puffy. And in particular, the usual place where this fluid accumulates is the legs. Because of gravity, it accumulates mainly in the legs. Because if you imagine uh, the venous system, 
uh, becoming distended from the hypervolemia, that blood, that fluid is subject to gravity and therefore you can imagine that actually it's mainly going to pull down in the venous system within the legs and there's going to be less of it up in the venous system at the top of the body if you're standing up either way. If you're lying down then this all, you know, this doesn't apply. Uh, if you're in a hospital bed, for instance, and you become hypervolemic, it might come out all over the place. So your arms might become puffy, your legs might become puffy, your face might even become puffy. But usually people are standing up or sitting, uh, in which case their legs are going to be lower than the rest of the body, and therefore the fluid goes to the legs and you become, uh, get puffy legs. And that's called peripheral edema or ankle edema or pedo edema. So that is one consequence then of heart failure that the kidneys cannot get rid of fluid properly and therefore you have to be very careful about how much fluid you drink or you put into yourself in other ways such as through IV fluids uh, when you have heart failure. Now this will not happen as long as they are very careful about how much fluid they consume. As long as they consume a reasonable fluid, so if they put themselves on a fluid restriction and as long as junior doctors don't give them IV fluids too quickly, then their kidneys will be able to cope, will be able to get rid of that amount of fluid that they're carefully taking and they won't become hypervolemic. Um, it's just if they drink too much that this will happen. And how can we treat this? Well, we can treat this with diuretics. Specifically, we use loop diuretics which are very powerful drugs that work on the kidneys and make the kidneys secrete fluid like mad. So the main example would be a drug called verusamide, um, but there is a more powerful example called bumetanide, and we use that in the case that verusamide doesn't work. So verusamide and bumetanide, loop diuretics, they work on the kidneys, they make them secrete fluid like mad, they make you pee like mad, um, and they can be used to treat hypervolemia. But the better way to treat hypervolemia is never to become hypervolemic in the first place. So it's to carefully restrict the amount of fluid someone is drinking. And of course, if they're quite a big person, then you'd restrict it to maybe two litres. If they're a tiny little person, then you'd maybe consider a restriction of 1.5 litres, maybe even one litre if they're absolutely, you know, if they're a frail, tiny little old lady, then one litre might be an appropriate fluid restriction. And as long as you control carefully the amount of fluid that you're putting in, the kidneys will be able to handle that despite the cardiorenal failure, and therefore they won't become hypervolemic. Now, hypervolemia, as well as causing peripheral edema, can worsen the two things that we're about to discuss, namely the impact of heart failure on the lungs and the impact of the heart failure on the liver. So let's now move on to these two topics. So these things can be referred to as cardiorespiratory failure, and cardiohepatic failure, respectively. And we've already brought these uh, two topics up in previous videos, so I'm just going to now solidify what we've said previously uh, here. So, we talked about how if you have left heart failure, i.e. if the cause of the heart failure is on the left side of the heart, this is going to lead to blood pooling in the left atrium, pooling in the pulmonary venous system, pooling in the pulmonary arterial system, etc. Uh, how, you know, blood pools effectively in the pulmonary circulation. This leads to higher pressures in the pulmonary capillaries, and just like how when you have higher pressures in the systemic capillaries, it leads to edema, in the pulmonary capillaries it's the same. It's going to lead to edema into the lung tissue. That is a phenomenon called pulmonary edema, uh, and that happens specifically in left heart failure rather than uh, right heart failure or bilateral heart failure. If, if it's bilateral heart failure, it's less likely that you're going to get this. You need to get blood pooling in the pulmonary circulation, and really for that, you need a mismatch between the left side and the right side. So you need the left side to be having more problems than the right side in order for blood to pool in the pulmonary circulation. So, um, if that happens, that mismatch where the left is having more problems than the right, it causes this pooling of blood in the pulmonary circulation, which leads to pulmonary edema that causes problems with gas exchange and therefore can lead to respiratory failure. We would refer to this as cardiorespiratory failure because you've got respiratory system failing because of the heart failing. And of course, if you become hypervolemic, uh, 
So if you drink too much or if a junior doctor gives you far too fast IV fluids and you become hypervolemic because of the cardiorenal failure, that is going to worsen the cardiorespiratory failure because now there's more blood in the whole circulatory system and that is going to lead to worse pooling of blood in the pulmonary circulation because, you know, if you're adding more fluid to the entire system, then the already uh, bad congestion or pooling of blood in the pulmonary circulation is going to get even worse. So you can worsen the cardiorespiratory failure by overloading someone with heart failure. So this will worsen uh, this. Not good. It will also worsen what we're about to discuss, which is the cardiohepatic failure. So cardiohepatic failure. Again, we've discussed this previously. If you get blood pooling in the right side of the heart, and we discussed how this can happen not only from right heart failure, but also from left heart failure, and indeed from bilateral heart failure. So when the right heart is having problems, we discussed how this leads to the tricuspid valve um, degenerating quicker, so you get tricuspid regurgitation, so you get blood regurgitating into the right atrium, and then from the right atrium it can then regurgitate up the superior vena cava and down the inferior vena cava, and then just below the diaphragm is then the liver, so if the blood's regurgitating into the inferior vena cava, it then goes into the hepatic veins and can damage the liver hugely, and you really can get quite horrific damage of the liver from this backflow from the right heart. So remember this backflow can occur if you've got right heart failure or if you've got left heart failure because as we've discussed left heart failure will cause pulmonary hypertension which will then cause the right heart to have problems. Or indeed if you've just got bilateral heart failure where both of them are having problems then again you might get this tricuspid regurgitation and this cardiohepatic uh, phenomenon. So the really important thing here is tricuspid regurgitation, TR. This is what is going to lead to this problem with the liver. So the blood flowing back, hitting the liver cells and damaging them. This can cause ALT to go through the roof. So remember, ALT, alanine transaminase, that is a marker that we test for frequently in clinical medicine. And when it is up, it means that liver cells have been dying and releasing this enzyme into the blood. So you can see this go huge in people with cardiohepatic failure. And then because the liver cells are being damaged, you can actually develop liver failure. How do we, what are the ramifications of liver failure? Well, the liver does so much, but frequently tests that we perform in clinical medicine are things like albumin, bilirubin, and coagulation. So we can measure INR. So I'll just explain this a little bit more. So the liver produces this protein called albumin, which it secretes into the blood. The job of albumin is to... Um, carry all sorts of things around the blood. Loads of things bind to albumin to be transported around the blood. It also gives the blood, um, you know, an osmotic, an osmolality so that uh, fluid remains within the actual blood um, and you don't get fluid moving out of the blood uh, because of osmotic pressures. So albumin is produced by the liver. When the liver is failing, so when in cardiohepatic failure where a huge number of the cells have been damaged by this backflow of blood into them, uh, you can get albumin going down. Moving on to bilirubin, bilirubin is a waste product from the breakdown of red blood cells and the liver is the organ that takes this waste product and breaks it down. Uh, it, well, it conjugates it and secretes it into bile, uh, which goes into the gastrointestinal tract and then is removed from the body through defecation. Um, when the liver is failing, bilirubin can go up in the blood. INR, the liver is responsible for producing all the proteins of the clotting cascade, so the coagulation factors. So when the liver is failing, these clotting factors don't get produced, and therefore clotting can become much, much slower. And remember what INR means. INR means how much longer your blood takes to clot than is, nor is normal. So, excuse me, if you've got an INR of three, that means that your blood takes three times longer to clot than is normal. Uh, at, so, INR will go up then if the clotting factors go down because it's going to take longer for the blood to clot because the clotting factors are not there. So these are tests that we perform frequently in clinical medicine and which would indicate liver failure if they showed this pattern.
So to summarise then, cardiohepatic failure, um, when the right heart is having trouble, either because of left heart failure or because of right heart failure or because of bilateral heart failure, you can get degeneration of the tricuspid valve and tricuspid regurgitation. Tricuspid regurgitation can lead to blood flowing backwards down the inferior vena cava into the hepatic veins and damaging liver cells. That can be that damage can be seen by ALT going through the roof. This is a marker of liver cell injury. When the liver cells break open, they release this enzyme, alanine transaminase into the blood. So when it goes up, we can um, infer that liver cells have died. In addition, from if the liver cells are being injured, that can actually lead to liver failure, the failure of the liver to do its job correctly. Tests that we perform relating to liver function are albumin, bilirubin and clotting. So Albumin will go down because it's a protein that is continuously being produced by the liver, and if the liver stops producing as much of it, then the level of it will go down within the blood. Bilirubin is a waste product that is taken out of the blood by the liver, conjugated and put into the bile uh, to be excreted from the body. If the liver is failing, bilirubin will go through the roof in the blood. And clotting, the clotting factors are produced by the liver, so if the liver is failing, you won't produce as many, and therefore your INR, which tells you how much longer your blood takes to clot than normal individuals, will skyrocket. So this pattern means liver failure, and that will be called cardiohepatic failure when that occurs. And again, if you are in a hypervolemic state because you have consumed too much fluids or because a junior doctor has given you too fast IV fluids, this whole thing will get worse because, again, there's going to be more blood in the whole circulatory system and that might lead to worsening um, regurgitation of blood into the inferior vena cava affecting the liver. So um, be very, very careful about giving fluids to people with heart failure. If you give them fluids really, really quickly, you can make them extremely hypervolemic and you might precipitate cardiorespiratory failure and cardiohepatic failure as a result of that. So it might be the case that in their no when they consume normal amounts of fluids and when they're not hypervolemic, that actually the heart doesn't result produce cardiorespiratory failure and cardiohepatic failure. It might be the case that, you know, there's not normally um, their their fluid status is fine and their heart the heart isn't bad enough to actually produce these at baseline, but if you overload them with fluids, you're going to massively worsen these situations. So you might actually be able to precipitate these in people just by overloading them with fluids if they've got heart failure. So be very, very careful about giving IV fluids. Um, so thank you for watching this video. We will end there. I hope that it has cleared some concepts up with regards to heart failure for you.